Welcome everybody, I'm Doug Tallamy from the University of Delaware, co-founder of Homegrown National Park. And that is exactly what I wanna talk about today. It's a small nonprofit. I wanna talk about how it came into being, what our goals are, and particularly what the rush in terms of joining Homegrown National Park is. Before I do that though, I wanna talk about some of the things that I get to see regularly at my house. This is one of them. Uh, reminds me when I, when I see this on a leaf of a bird fecal sack, you know, when birds are rearing their young, uh, they don't want a lot of poop in the nest. So the adults take the poop little sacks out and then drop them. They land on vegetation and they look just like that. But if you get closer, uh, you can see that this is actually a spider. And at night, that spider hangs from the leaf, drops a single strand of sticky, sticky goo. Uh, and that's what it hunts with. It does not spin a web. This is a bola spider. Uh, an unusual type of spider. You wouldn't think anything would fly into that, that sticky glop of glue, but in fact, moths do on a pretty regular basis. And the spider wraps them up several times, has a good meal. And after it's had enough meals, it will spin a, a, a elaborate cocoon in, and have eggs in there. So this is how it reproduces. And that egg case spends the winter. But after it makes a single egg case, it'll go hunting again for more moths. Now it's not a, it's not an accident at all that moths are flying into this this uh, single strand of silk because this spider is emitting the sex pheromone of one particular species of moth and at my house that is the bronze cutworm so it's male bronze cutworms that are flying in to that bola spider because they think that uh, the spider is a female cutworm. Now I have bronze cutworms at my house and the larvae that make those adults because I've got goldenrod, that is their primary host. I also have this beautiful moth, a dot lined white because I have oak trees uh, and I have the moth because I don't rake the leaves of the oak trees away. The cocoon of that moth is actually in this, this leaf litter. You probably don't see it, but that's it right there. There's no way you'd see it when you're when you're uh, actually dealing with the leaves in your, your yard. But that's one of the downsides of raking your leaves away. You're raking away a lot of the things that are associated with those leaves. I have evening primrose moths at my house because I planted evening primrose. The moth comes and spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but it's always very cute. I have zebra swallowtails because I have pawpaws. I have pawpaws because I planted them specifically so the zebra swallowtail populations would come. As a matter of fact, it would take me a long time, uh, a week, a year, to talk about all of the species interactions that are now occurring uh, on our, our property because we put a lot of plants back. It would not take me very long to talk about what's happening on this property uh, because they have no goldenrod, so they have no bronze cutworms, so they have no bola spiders, they have no oak trees, so they have no dot line whites, they have no evening primrose, so they have no evening primrose moths, no pawpaws, so they don't have any zebra swallowtails. As a matter of fact, there's very little that's happening on a typical residential landscape in the US. And the problem, of course, is that we've got 135 million acres of those typical residential landscapes that were designed for aesthetics, but not for ecological function. And that's why we're seeing lots of headlines these days, very unhappy headlines, like the insect apocalypse is here, talking about global insect decline. Uh, followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Two thirds of Earth's wildlife is already gone. The UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. 40% of Earth's plants face extinction. Um, not good news at all. And that is why Elizabeth Colbert gets to write The Sixth Extinction. Talking about the sixth great extinction event this planet has ever experienced, we are right in the middle of it. And of course, it's the first one that's caused by an animal, us. There are actually people studying uh, our reaction to biodiversity losses. It's upsetting to a lot of people. Richard Hobbs is one of them. And he says that our reaction has been very similar to the five stages of grief that we experience when we get the news we have a terminal disease. First stage is denial. No, we don't have the disease. But there's certainly a lot of denial that we don't have any, any issues with biodiversity. Anger. A lot of people are upset about it. I'm one of them. Bargaining, what can we do to fix it? Depression, yeah, you gotta fight that all the time. The fifth stage is acceptance. Uh, and, and this is where I'm going to push back. Acceptance is equivalent to giving up as if there's nothing we can do about it. Um, and giving up is not an option here, folks, because nature is not optional. If we wanna remain on this planet, we need to have natural systems. 
So I'm going to propose a sixth action or a sixth stage, and that would be action. We actually can improve the situation. Now, we do have parks. We do have preserves. Our national parks in particular, uh, beautiful, wonderful places, they were established because they were beautiful places. It was, it was really an exercise in preserving exquisite scenery, the best scenery that we have in the entire country. And Teddy Roosevelt had a lot to do with that. He said, the establishment of the National Park Service is justified by the considerations of good administration. So Teddy was patting himself on the back there. The value of natural beauty as a national as asset and the effectiveness of outdoor life and recreation in the production of good citizenships. In other words, our parks were created because they were pretty places for us to play in. And that's a fine reason. They're beautiful places for us to play in, but conservation was not the major issue. And that's why we've only preserved 3.6% of the U.S. in national parks. 12% is federally protected. Uh, but that leaves, uh, you know, more than 80% of the country that does not have federal protection. And what's happening in that 80% is appalling. Every 30 seconds, a football field worth of America's natural areas disappears to development. Development, the most oxymoronic word in, in all of uh, ecology. We've got uh, 44 million acres of lawn. Uh, in this country, that's an area the size of New England. We have paved over an area larger than Ohio, and that's a very old statistic, so I'm sure it's much larger than Ohio at this point. Two million acres of golf courses, which is an area larger than Rhode Island and Delaware combined. We could go on and on with, with uh, crazy statistics like that. None of them are acceptable. Well, let's ask why our parks and preserves are not sustaining the biodiversity that we need. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons, but this is the big one. They're too small. They're too small. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a little, little patch, a little habitat patch, and this is an exaggeration, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small or tiny populations. And that's the problem uh, because small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. That's because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. In bad times, they go down. If you're a large population, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals so you can increase quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population, you're going to fluctuate just like all populations, and you often hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat patch. Uh, and unless you can recolonize, uh, that's that's called local extinction. And recolonization is very tough these days because it's it's so inhospitable outside of these preserves. Imagine a box turtle crossing uh, Route 95. It's, it's not going to happen. And there is uh, research from all over the world. Some of them uh, studies quite long, over 100 years old at this point. And they're all saying the same thing. The natural areas that we have left on the planet are not large enough to sustain the amount of nature that we need because it is nature that sustains us. Now, we tend to use extinction as a metric of, of trouble. I don't like that because that's like going to the doctor after you're dead. Uh, not going to help much. We need to uh, look at what's happening before uh, populations become extinct. And what's happening to uh, organisms that once were very common is the most uh, having the biggest impact on our ecosystems. You're looking at a picture of American chestnut. It used to be a dominant tree um, all along the, the Appalachian crest from uh, Maine all the way down to Georgia. And of course, it's it's uh, wiped out by the chestnut blight. So it's the it's the loss of uh, species that were once common uh, that is the big problem because they are the ones that were really dominating ecosystem function. This is the rusty patch bumblebee. It used to be one of the most common bumblebees in the country. Now, if you find one, it's a very special event. Beavers. Um, now, they're not certainly not extinct, and they're actually coming back a little bit, but they determined the hydrology of the entire country before European settlers came over. Uh, we essentially wiped them out functionally uh, and changed the hydrology of the entire country. So we're really talking about, rather than extinction, it's defaunation that is the problem, the reduction in the abundance of populations. It's local. It's happening everywhere. And surprisingly, we don't notice it. We don't notice it largely because of shifting baseline. We tend to think that uh, the, what is normal is what was uh, the condition when we were growing up. So if we're born into a world that's already uh, lost a lot of its biodiversity, we think that's normal. Um, none of us, for example, miss the passenger pigeon. 
It was the most numerous bird on the entire planet, uh, but it was gone long before any of us were, were born. Um, so shifting baseline is very common, and it means that we're losing our biodiversity, the biodiversity that sustains us, and we don't even notice it. So we have to do something about what shall we do? Well, uh, a lot of people are interested in, in biodiversity these days, including the UN. Uh, the UN, you know, it's meeting, just had a big, big conference in, in uh, Canada. Uh, but this was, a, this was a headline from that conference. Crucial negotiations to protect biodiversity are moving at a snail's pace. We're negotiating whether or not we're going to protect uh, what keeps us alive on, on this planet. Well, Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson from Harvard, a uh, very famous professor. He died two years ago uh, at this point. He's not going to wait for, for uh, the UN to make a resolution. Um, he had an extremely long career, uh, and a lot of it was focused on saving life on planet Earth. He loved biodiversity, uh, and he wanted to save it, not because he loved it, but because he knew it was essential to our own survival. So in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And he had one simple message. If we're going to save life, if we're going to save uh, nature anywhere on the planet, we're going to have to save nature on at least half of the planet. And when I say life, I'm talking about human life as well. So we're going to have to put half of the, of the planet uh, aside. Functioning ecosystems will have to be happy on half of planet Earth. It's a very bold statement. And he spent most of the, the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a, a conservation biologist, um, that's good news. We'll just put half the Earth aside and all the things that are declining or disappearing uh, can be in that half and, and it'll be wonderful. Problem is half of planet Earth is already in some form of agriculture, half of terrestrial Earth. Uh, we're certainly not going to use that to save biodiversity. And we've got 8 billion people. And all of our roadways and, and, and highways and, and airports and detritus in the other half. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how can we actually do this? How can we realize E.O. Wilson's dream? Well, I think we can, uh, but we need a new approach to conservation to do that. We've got to give up the idea that humans and nature cannot coexist. This is, you know, we've had that idea for, for eons. Uh, we can't exist in, in the same place at the same time. Well, what I want to argue today is that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and, and uh, practice conservation where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. So we have to practice conservation, not just in, in pristine areas like this, but in areas like this. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every single year, but thrive. Here's the problem. Uh, with all of our development, we have fragmented viable habitat, and we got little teeny habitat patches scattered all, all around. Now, the proposal is to make biological corridors that connect those habitats so that the populations within them can move back and forth, uh, hopefully connecting them to the point where uh, if one habitat uh, has a problem, they're, they're not cut off from another habitat. But the size of the habitat is still tiny, uh, which means the populations are still tiny, which means when they fluctuate, there is still the risk of, of extinction. So I think we have to go beyond this, this model of uh, biological carters and actually create viable habitat, um, not just places for plants and animals to move, but viable habitat where they can live and breed and reproduce outside of the habitats that remain. This is uh, good. This is even better. We want to put as many plants back to create viable habitat outside of preserved areas. Um, the less uh, uh, planted areas will be, you know, our cities and our and our agriculture. But the more we do with do this, uh, the more viable habitat will be outside of these parks and preserves, connecting them, and the populations will be able to grow and not be as vulnerable to local extinction. But to achieve this, we're talking about practicing conservation on private property, which means we're going to have to reevaluate our attitude towards property rights. We do have this idea that we can own part of the earth and that we have the right to do anything we want on that piece of the earth. Unfortunately, our yards are not like Las Vegas. 
Now, you all know that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, but what happens in our yards does not stay on our yards. That is the ecological problem here. That's because our properties, our yards are part of local ecosystems. So whatever we do to them impacts the entire ecosystem that surrounds us. So for example, let's say you have uh, a lot of lawn. The amount of lawn you have is going to determine whether rain infiltrates and, and recharges your, your local watershed, groundwater, uh, or whether it leaves a stormwater runoff. It's going to determine whether you're adding nitrogen and phosphorus and herbicides and insecticides, all those pollutants to your local watershed. It's going to determine how much carbon you're adding to the atmosphere every single time you mow. How you landscape is going to determine whether or not you're, you're supporting pollinator populations or whether you're eliminating the resources that they need. How you landscape is going to determine how much carbon you're actually pulling out of the atmosphere, sequestering, capturing. That's, of course, what plants do. And the more plants you have in your property, the more carbon you're going to remove from the, from the atmosphere. Plants build their tissues out of carbon, and then they pump that extra carbon into the ground through their root systems. And once it's in the ground, it's very stable. It can stay there uh, thousands of years. Plant choices. The plant choices we make for our properties are going to determine whether we're harboring ecological tumors, uh, like those invasive ornamentals that, that so many people have. This is calorie pear, and this is what they do. They escape into our natural areas, pushing out the native plants that support uh, the, the ecosystems around us. And our plant choice is going to determine uh, whether or not we have, have uh, productive food webs, whether we're using the plants that actually support the insects that support uh, breeding in so many other animals, particularly our birds. In short, how we landscape is going to determine how much life Earth can sustain. That's an awesome responsibility. It's an awesome responsibility that now lies with property owners. And the problem is most of them don't know that. But it does create an opportunity here. It creates a, a grassroots solution to the biodiversity crisis. Most of the country is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% of the country east of the Mississippi is privately owned. And it's privately owned by hundreds of millions of people. That's a big army if we all get them working to save biodiversity on their private properties. So collectively, in my view, property owners are now the hope and the future of conservation. Lawn's the low-hanging fruit here. We've talked a lot about lawn, so let's, let's start with that. Again, 44 million acres of lawn in an area bigger than the size of New England, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Now, we do that because it's a status symbol, uh, and we need to display our Halloween decorations. But what if we reduce the area of lawn? What if we cut the area of lawn in half? Let's make the math simple. Say we got 40 million acres, we cut the area in half. That'll give us 20 million acres that we can put towards conservation, that we can restore right where we live. Uh, and if we do that, we can create what we are calling Homegrown National Park, and it will be huge. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge. Plus the Great Smoky Mountains, add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park in the country. Now, I had this idea way back in 2007. I started talking about it in my, my talks. Um, then when I wrote Nature's Best Hope, uh, I made a chapter that I called Homegrown National Park. Uh, but it wasn't until I met Michelle Alfandari that uh, we actually created uh, the, the nonprofit that we're talking about today. Um, Michelle is, is a perfect example of what we call the non-choir. People often say to me, you know, you only talk to the choir, the tree huggers. I said, yes, that's only, it's only the choir that invites me. Well, Michelle had just retired from uh, uh, business, semi-retired from business in Manhattan uh, and moved to Connecticut. One of her neighbors uh, dragged her to one of my talks uh, and she came up to me afterwards and said, you know, you're, you've got, and if you're going to succeed in what you want to do, you've got to get beyond the choir. Uh, and Michelle said, I'm, a, I'm an example of a non-choir. I know nothing about conservation. I didn't know we had a biodiversity problem. Um, yet, uh, I am now interested in it. I do know how to build a movement. Uh, so she convinced me that, that uh, we would actually create Homegrown National Park. Uh, and the, it's, Again, it's it's a it's a small nonprofit. You can go there by homegrownnationalpark.org, 
And the feature of, of our nonprofit is to get people to register their properties on, we call it on the map. It's free. So there's no, uh, you know, there's, you know, it doesn't cost anything. You register your location and the amount of area on your private property that you're going to start to be a good steward of. Maybe you're going to reduce the area of lawn. Maybe you're going to plant an oak tree. Maybe you're going to put an aster in a flower pot. Any of it counts. Maybe you're just going to make a commitment to do these things. Then you, you, um, your little piece of your county is going to light up and you'll get to see who else in your county has joined Homegrown National Park. The object, of course, is to get the message that everybody, particularly all the people that don't have a clue about this, is the future of conservation. We want that message to go viral, to, to reach everybody in the country. Uh, and each state now is, is color-coded by the number of uh, people, uh, the percentage of people, according to the, the population, that uh, are participating in Homegrown National Park. The darker green you are, the bigger the participation. So there's actually a, a little competitiveness in here. You want your, you want your state to, to be number one, you're going to have to get everybody else to join. What are we asking? We're asking people to reduce the area in lawn. Lawn does not do any of the ecological things that, that need to happen. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, and one of the things that we have to do is put the native plants that support our ecosystems back into our human dominated landscapes. So again, we'll start with our individual properties. Remove the invasive plants, the non-native plants that we've used as ornamentals uh, for a long time. Many of them escape and, and uh, ecologically castrate local ecosystems. So we want to remove them from our properties. If we're protecting any natural areas on our properties, we want to keep doing that. There are uh, real measurable ecological products. Uh, and one of them would be obvious, a significant increase in the biodiversity that our property is supporting. Measurable reduction in, in invasive species. Uh, so if you have a lot of invasive species on your property, you've got to get rid of those uh, and replace them with the important native plants. Remember, if 78% of the country is privately owned or 85% east of the Mississippi is privately owned and everybody got rid of the invasive plants on their private properties, we'd be 85% done in the east, 78% done all over the country. Then the seed rain that's falling on our public properties would decrease over time uh, and we'd better be able to get a much better handle on this invasive species problem. Uh, if we convert our lawns into plantings like this, for example, we're going to create a significant drawdown of atmospheric CO2. All of these plants are built out of carbon. They're sequestering a whole lot more carbon uh, than lawn does and pumping a lot more into the soil. So uh, the more plants we have, the more we're going to help climate change. And of course, this is going to transform what used to be no man's land outside of parks and preserves into viable habitats and start to build that connectivity I talked about a few minutes ago. There are important sociological products as well, though. National awareness, not just of what the problems are, but what the solutions are and your role in the solutions. We want to change the culture. We want people to recognize that, that nature is not optional and that everybody has a responsibility to sustaining it because everybody requires it. We want to convert hope into action. Hope is great, but action's even better. And we want to remerge, merge uh, existing national conservation efforts like Audubon and National Wildlife Federation and Wild Ones and, and, and uh, Sierra Club and so on. They're all doing wonderful work. A lot of good conservation is happening on private properties. Uh, but if every all these members here uh, get those conservation efforts on the map, we now have a good measure of how close we're getting to our 3030 uh, initiative, preserving 30% of the U.S. by 2030. And remember, we're not drawing any membership away from these organizations because we don't charge. Uh, everybody can, can belong to Homegrown National Park and these organizations at the same time. So back to the, the urgency we, we opened the talk with. Um, we've, got to, we've got to do this quickly, folks, because species are disappearing quickly. We got 135 million acres of residential landscapes in this country. So if we just focus on the residential landscapes, and if we add 1,000 acres to Homegrown National Park each month, sounds like we're doing, doing a good job, but it would take us 11,250 years to meet our ultimate goal. So a slow build is, is obviously not, not gonna do it. It's not good enough. What we need to do is, is make a number of things common knowledge for property owners everywhere. 
And the first is to recognize the ecological goals that your property has. Every property has to support a food web. Every property has to sequester carbon. Every property has to manage the, the watershed in which it lies. And every property has to support pollinators. Has, has, has to become common knowledge. And the fact that lawn does none of those things also has to become common knowledge. We also have to, to learn that, uh, really emphasize, plant choice matters. Uh, the plants we choose is, are going to determine how well uh, you support the biodiversity on your property. There are three kinds of plants out there. There are plants that contribute energy to local food webs. Remember, plants are capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into food. And whether or not they pass that food on to animals determines whether you have any animals or not. And if you have no animals, you don't have a functioning ecosystem. So the ones that are actually passing it on, contributing it to, eco to food webs, we will call contributors. The plants that, that capture energy from the sun but don't pass it on, we'll call non-contributors. And then there's actually plants that detract energy, remove energy from local food webs by pushing out the native plants that do contribute. A great example of a contributor, the best example of a contributor in 84% of the counties in which it occurs is one of the oak trees, genus Quercus. They are, are contributing more energy to local food webs than any other type of plant. Ginkgo, Ginkgo biloba from Asia uh, is a good example of a non-contributor. Uh, it's a nice ornamental, it's good fall color, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So uh, it's not contributing energy to local food webs. And a great example of, of uh, a non-contributor would be any of the invasive ornamentals that, that we have that are not supporting, they're not passing on any energy, nothing can eat these things, uh, but they also escape into our natural areas and push out the native plants that do contribute energy. So they're detracting energy from local food webs. Uh, so this, is, this has to become common knowledge as well. We need to start to appreciate how important caterpillars are in local food webs. They're the bread and butter of local food webs because they are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if you design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, you're going to have a failed food web and eventually a failed ecosystem. Therefore, the plants that produce the most caterpillars, the ones I call keystone plants, are essential components of all healthy uh, landscapes. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take uh, keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they're making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the, the keystone plants uh, in your the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours, the support system that's holding that house up. They're essential. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last, last hundred years. How do you know what the best keystone plants are for, for where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of both the best woody plants and herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. We have to appreciate a lot more than we have the, the great wisdom that E.O. Wilson provided for us. Way back in 1987, he wrote a paper called The Little Things That Run the World, um, telling us that if insects were to disappear from planet Earth, so would we. So would just about everything else. Um, we haven't, haven't uh, uh, embraced that to the degree that we, we have to. And we also have to understand that most of the insects that eat plants can only eat particular plants. They're what we call host plant specialists. Plants defend themselves. They don't want to be eaten by insects, so they load their tissues with nasty chemicals. And only the, the insects with the adaptation to get around the chemicals of particular plants, they're the only ones that can eat those plants. It takes a long period of evolutionary history with all those plant lineages for those adaptations to fall into place. Uh, and once they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. The monarch butterfly is a perfect example, but it's not an exception. 90% of the insects that eat plants are just like the monarch. They can only eat particular plants. And you know that monarchs can only eat milkweeds. They are host plant specialists on milkweeds, which are toxic plants. Milkweeds protect themselves with cardiac glycosides and sticky latex sap. And most insects cannot deal with that, but monarchs can. They have the adaptations to detoxify the cardiac glycosides uh, and to block the flow of the latex sap. That's what specialization does. Uh, but if you take away the, the, the milkweeds on your property and replace them with hostas, 
monarchs are not going to be able to start to eat hostas. Uh, they're locked into eating milkweed. So specialization works great as long as you have the plants that you specialized on. We also have to understand uh, the, the importance of, of pollinators. Now we're doing, we're doing better at that. There's a lot of media attention telling us that we need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. That's not actually accurate. Um, it's about a 12th of our crops uh, and we need pollinators, not just in agriculture, but, but everywhere. Uh, and that's because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, and that is not an option. We need to uh, understand the importance of leaf litter that falls from the trees on our property. Leaf litter does a number of things. One important one is to return the nutrients that that tree used that year to the soil so that it can take it up and use it again in future years. Uh, leaf litter also creates a blanket that covers the soil and protects the soil moisture which is something that, that uh, all the organisms that live in the soil require. They all require high humidity. And I'm, I'm including the uh, uh, mycorrhizal uh, fungal associations that allow transfer nutrients from the soil to plant roots. They're extremely important organisms. They all require high soil and this blanket of leaves or high moisture, blanket of leaves on the soil protects them. There are more species that live in the soil than above the soil. And their major job is to break down these leaves and get that those nutrients back into the soil. But of course, if you rake your leaves away, you're losing all, all of those advantages. People say, well, I can't keep leaves around because I can't garden with leaves. Yes, you can. There are a number of, of uh, plants. Most of them will, will do well with leaf litter uh, on the bottom of the, uh, the bed. Leaf litter is the best mulch that, that we have out there and you can still garden quite successfully. We have to understand that light pollution is one of the major causes of, of insect declines. Uh, but there's fortunately, this is, this is an easy one. There's an easy solution to that. And that is to, you can turn your lights off. That would certainly help. But if you don't wanna do that, replace the white bulbs uh, in your, the, the security light over your barn or over your garage or over your front porch with a yellow bulb. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than are white uh, wavelengths. Um, so if we did that overnight, we would save millions of insects. And if we switched to yellow LEDs, we'd save millions of dollars as well. Mosquito fogging, booming business around the country. Um, several reasons why this is, this is an ecological disaster. Uh, first of all, the, the mosquito foggers tell you that it's okay because it's a natural product. It is a natural product. It's pyrethroids from chrysanthemums, but cyanide is a natural product. Ricin is a natural product. Nature makes a lot of, of really toxic things. So that's that argument doesn't hold much water. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. Not true, not even close to true. It kills all the insects it comes in contact with. And look, it comes in contact with all of the insects. All those pollinators were trying to save the monarchs. There's a big, big uh, monarch kill, hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground a couple of years ago when they flew through Mosquito Joe. The interesting thing is it doesn't control mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. It's too hard. You have to kill 90% of them. These mosquito foggers kill between 10 and 50% of, of the mosquitoes. So it's not even close to, to being effective. If you really wanna control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. And this is a wonderful way to do it um, with biological control. You simply get a bucket and fill it full of water, put in a handful of, of uh, straw or hay or, or maybe dead leaves, um, let put it out in the sun and let algae and diatom populations build up in your bucket of water. That becomes an irresistible brew to uh, female mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs and they will lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and get a sheet of mosquito dunks, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is formulated to only kill aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. So it's targeted, it's cheap. And if everybody did it, it would be very effective. Um, we want to realize that every property is, is important in, in this future role of conservation, even small ones. Um, this is Pam Carlson's uh, lot in, in uh, Chicago. It's a tenth of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size. Uh, and concert, look, it's, it's wonderfully landscaped with native plants. She's got 124 bird species that have used her property. 
But even, even people with essentially no bare ground to, to uh, put plants in can participate with container gardening. Uh, our, our native bees are very mobile. So are our, our butterflies and they will be able to use the plants we put on our porches or our balconies if we do it. Now, fortunately, we do have a silver bullet in our fight against climate change and the biodiversity crisis. And that is that conservation works. This is the Natchusa grasslands. There's a lot of examples. I'm only going to give you a, a few, but the Natchusa grasslands, uh, 3,800 acres in Illinois. There's 730 native plant species there. 180 species of birds uh, use these properties, and it used to be a cornfield. So conservation does work. Um, um, let's talk about uh, what's happening right at, at, at uh, our house right here, my house in, in uh, Oxford, Pennsylvania. This is where my wife, Cindy, and I moved in the year 2000. Um, it was a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots uh, and they had mowed it for hay for several years before we, we bought it. But three years before we actually moved in, they stopped mowing for hay. And when you mow for hay in Southeast Pennsylvania, you're really moving mowing the rootstocks of all the invasive plants that are around there. So when, when we actually moved in, this is what the property looked like. It was Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and on and on and on. And there is Cindy getting rid of all of this stuff. You can't do restoration with plants from Asia. So that's step one. Um, I'm showing you this to um, convince you that it's possible. Yes, it's a lot of work, uh, but Cindy did 99% of it. Uh, and and she's just a skinny little thing. So um, so you can to or you can hire somebody to do it. But getting rid of these things on your property is step one. This is what our our uh, house looks like today from the same perspective that I took that first picture. Um, and I have been counting. My research has shown over the last twenty years that the number of moth species in your local food web is a good index of uh, the quality of that food web, how stable it is and how productive it is. Because remember, the moths are making the caterpillars that, that run that food web. So for the last five years, I've been taking pictures of every moth species I have found on our property. And I'm up to 1,199 species of, of moths. And I'm not finished. I added 100 last year. So there's still more out there. Not sure how high it will go. Uh, and some of them are, are, are beautiful and, and have some interesting names like the chinkapin leaf miner, the skull cap skeletonizer, the neighbor, the little devil, the horrid zaley, the scallop sallow, the obtuse yellow, the explicit arches. And yes, there's an implicit arches as well. The snowy shouldered aclaris, the grateful midget, the pink shaded fern moth, the scribbler, the lemon plagotis, the showy emerald, the green marvel, Harris's three spot, the bride, eyed pectes, tufted bird dropping moth. Who wouldn't want the tufted bird dropping moth at their house? This is my favorite, the spun glass catapult and hundreds of others uh, that I can go out and find on any, any given day. Uh, and people say, well, gee, well, all those caterpillars there, they're going to eat all, all of your plants. No, they're not, because they're not the only thing that's there. I've got an entire community of things that eat caterpillars, like birds. Um, you know, our birds, particularly when they're breeding, eat hundreds of caterpillars every single day, every single bird. Uh, and we have 60 species of birds that we've recorded breeding on our, our 10 acres because we've got the caterpillars that allow them to do that. We also have other predators. We've got ambush bugs and assassin bugs and predatory stink bugs. This guy was sitting next to this, this uh, aggregation of um, milkweed tussock moth, and it was eating one of these a day, kind of like a vitamin pill. Lots of species of, of hymenoptera and parasitoids, uh, most of which are attacking caterpillars all the time, predatory wasps that are living off of caterpillars. And then we've got the vertebrates that are eating insects all the time, like skunks and possums and raccoons. Foxes, 25% of a fox's diet is, is insects, cute little tree frogs. We've got toads, we've got salamanders, we've got ring neck snakes all eating insects and the cutest little gray tree frogs, which actually are green when they're little. We've got grandchildren too. All right, that's what's happening in lawns. But lawn, if we, if we focus only on lawns, our goals are too modest because most of the land is not in lawn. Most of the land is in privately owned woodlots 
cropland or rangeland. So let's talk about how those properties can be involved in homegrown national park as well. We've got 406 million acres of, of woodlots that are managed by private citizens, not logging companies in the US. Uh, and yes, they're managed uh, for the most part for, for wood extraction. Uh, but you can do that sustainably. And you also have to manage the invasive species load in these woodlots. So uh, organizations like the Foundation for Sustainable Forests uh, will tell us how to manage these woodlots sustainable. There are two ways you can log your, your woodlot. You can do high-grade harvesting or what Troy Firth calls worst first forest management. High-grade uh, management is not management at all. You're, you're logging the best trees uh, and you get a very good harvest once then you're done at least for 80 years. Worst first is you're taking smaller, more frequent harvests, uh, which you can do indefinitely. It leads to higher yields over time uh, because you're not destroying the uh, most powerful trees in your forest. But this is this is the real challenge in, in woodlot management. It's the fact that they are so heavily invaded with uh, escapees from our gardens. This is a, um, a park, uh, it's a White Clay Creek State Park, which is very, very near me. Um, and what you're looking at are all the invasive plants from, from Asia that leaf out before plants from North America. So I took this picture in March, uh, and every bit of green you see there is, is from Asia. Again, multiflora rose and oriole and bittersweet and, and autumn olive and, and on and on and on. So we've got an invasive species problem. Managing it is a real challenge, but you're not going to do it unless you manage the deer, because an over overabundance of deer from coast to coast, by the way, is one of the major reasons we've got invasive plants. They eat the native plants and leave the non-native plants. So of course you've got invasive plants. Uh, so unless we we manage deer, um, we're going to have no understory, no ground no ground nesting birds, no recruitment into our forest. We will have Lyme disease. We will have uh, Japanese stilt grass and Asian jumping worms and all the other things that are associated with deer. Uh, this is what happens when you have a deer exposure. You have a, a, actually a, a, a functional, healthy woodlot. Deer management is an essential part of managing our woodlots. What about cropland? Got a lot of cropland. Every place that's light green here is cropland. 410 million acres of, of uh, cropland in the U.S. alone, and most of it is, is privately owned. Uh, so you might say, well, there's nothing we can do with our agriculture to improve biodiversity, but that is not true. There's four things we can do, and they will have a huge effect on biodiversity. We can manage roadsides better. We can put the hedgerows back. We can include prairie strips into our corn and soybeans, and we can limit our use of neonicotinoid insecticides. Um, this is what maintained monarch populations until we got rid of the, quote, weeds on the side of, of roadsides. Uh, and replace them with, with lawn. Uh, the weeds were milkweed, it was native asters, it was all the things that kept our monarch populations and uh, our native bee populations healthy for, for, um, for more than 100 years. No problem at all until we got rid of those plants. So instead of having this as the farm ethic where you, you, you spray with Roundup right to the road, kill all of the quote weeds, our healthy native plants, replace them with lawn that then has to be mowed uh, you can put all that stuff back. And more and more people are doing that. Um, that should be the new farm ethic, and it will do uh, wonders in, in terms of supporting biodiversity. Put the hedgerows back too. Multi-species native hedgerows. Um, you know, when you, when you allow your hedgerows to become invaded with non-native plants, you lose the ecological functionality. And I'm going to give you one quick study uh, to demonstrate that. I went into hedgerows in uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware with an undergraduate a few years ago, and we measured uh, in a standardized way caterpillar populations in hedgerows that were invaded with non-native plants and hedgerows that were not invaded with non-native plants. And what we found is when the hedgerows were invaded, they reduced caterpillar populations by six, or the number of species by 68%, the abundance of those caterpillars by 91%, and the biomass, the actual energy involved with those caterpillars by 96%. So if you think of caterpillars as bird food, you've reduced bird food by 96% when you allow these non-native plants to, to go crazy in your hedgerows. Prairie strips, wonderful additions. A lot of good research going on in, in Iowa about how valuable these things are. You can put them right through the corn and the soybeans and create viable habitat, very productive habitat, not just for pollinators, but when you orient them um, perpendicular to the flow of water across your farmland, it reduces topsoil loss by 95%. 
What a, what a great way to save our topsoil. Reduces water pollution by 90%. So all the nutrients you put on your, your crop is not flowing into the Mississippi River and down to the Gulf to create a dead zone. Um, you're losing a little bit of land, but look, it's supported by, by USDA CRP program. So it is a win-win for everybody. And then finally, minimizing uh, neonicotinoid, the use of neonicotinoids. Now it's a, it comes as a seed coating. Uh, for just about everything you buy, you have to search to get, get uh, plants without neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids are, are insecticides um, based on nicotine, essentially, that are 7,000 times more toxic to insects than DDT was. This is serious stuff. They're used preventively. In other words, whether or not you have an insect problem, you get the neonicotinoid. Uh, the interesting thing is, if you use them or don't use them, it doesn't increase yield at all. So we're, we're coating our seeds for, with an insecticide that is not necessary. It does not improve yield. Only 5% of this material is taken up by the plant. The other 95% is washed off into our watershed where it stays for a long time and, or blown away on our dust. And we don't even know what that does to, to all the insects around us. So um, please minimize the use of, of neonicotinoids. Then finally, rangeland. It's the biggest chunk of land that we have out there, 770 million acres of rangeland, four and a half times the size of Texas that can be managed in a, in a biodiversity friendly way. This is a, a um, experimental range in Nebraska. Those are cattle, it's not bison. These are all sunflowers. Um, Cindy and I walked around here, all the birds were there. It was a wonderful place. Remember all of our grasslands have evolved with grazers. They need grazers to, to stay healthy uh, grasslands. So it's not the presence of cattle that's a problem. It's overgrazing that's a problem, which is easy to manage uh, and keeping the, the cows out of the water. When they have access to the streams, they eat the cottonwoods and the willows that are growing along the, the streams. And that really reduces the biodiversity and the effectiveness of the waterway little fencing there and we can keep the cows out of the streams. Okay, there's something that's common to each one of these conservation approaches. Uh, and that is that whether or not they succeed depends on decisions that people make, decisions that, that people like you and I make every day. I had a student uh, in, a, in a final exam last, last year, Amanda Crandall, um, who said that, you know, while conservationists claim to be managing species and habitats, what we're really managing is people. Uh, and she she is so right about that. Um, so how we how whether or not we convince people that these are important things to do is going to determine whether or not we we succeed. We are talking about changing our culture from an adversarial re, uh, relationship with nature to a collaborative one. It's time to start working with nature. So the real question is, can we do this? Uh, and and I say yes, of course we can do it. You don't have to say biodiversity for a living but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, so many more and more people are recognizing the planet uh, has some serious issues uh, these days, uh, but they all feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can modify your, your uh, nighttime lights. One person can add a pollinator garden. One person can remove the invasive plants that are already on your property. One person can add keystone plants, fire your mosquito fogger, join homegrown national park, all kinds of things that one person can do and make a huge difference in the, the ecological productivity of their property. Uh, and it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. That will be depressing. Just think about the piece of the planet that you as an individual can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, Help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So we hope that Homegrown National Park will provide the motivation and the guidance for millions of people to tackle these conservation challenges. And when you do, it's fun. It's healthy. Uh, it, it is very rewarding. So how we, how we act now is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. Please join Homegrown National Park and get on the map. Thanks very much.